Hello friends, I'm Mike Gonzalez. Thanks for joining us as we rediscover the most sacred and vital resource for the Pacific Northwest, our rivers. From Idaho to Seattle, the Columbia and Snake River system impacts all of us. We wanna share and celebrate the story of our amazing river system with you. We'll talk about its history, its salmon, its power, and how people are working to ensure that our rivers aren't just protected, but thriving. The rivers we love impact homes here and miles away. The Columbia and Snake Rivers have been home to salmon and trout since the Ice Ages. For generations, Native tribes have celebrated salmon as a major food source and cultural icon. As European settlers moved in, the river served both as transportation and food source for the growing population. Settlements began to change the natural landscape of the region. The Snake, Columbia, and Willamette Rivers served as population centers. Towns like Lewiston, Pasco, and Portland formed along the banks of the rivers. Goods moved up and down the rivers on early barges and steamboats. Fish canneries lined the shores of the Columbia and commercial fishermen harvested the fish supply. This often resulted in overfishing of salmon and many fish, decimating their numbers drastically. In the 1920s, the U.S. government prepared plans for the development of navigation, flood control, irrigation, and hydropower in the Columbia River Basin. The 1930s were a pivotal time here in the Northwest. The Depression hit, and Washington State was facing a dust bowl. Recently, the Washington Potato Commission produced a documentary about the history of Washington potatoes. They shared a bit of that history with us as it pertains to the Columbia River during this time. As the 1930s approached, most areas throughout Washington were in the middle of one of the worst droughts in history. Dry stream beds resulted in power shortages throughout the Pacific Northwest. Topsoil began blowing away. The Dust Bowl wasn't just happening in Oklahoma. It was happening in Washington. The wind always blows here in the spring. And I was headed to Quincy one night, and I, I couldn't even see the ornament on my hood. It was in everything because the houses weren't very well built. You'd feel it in your mouth and in your eyes, and it was, you know, forget about housekeeping. Imagine half a million acres and a 25 mile an hour wind coming up and there's no trees or grass to hold anything in place. And so two days later, you'd have, you know, two or three inches of sand in your house. Billy Johnson came west here with her brand new husband from Ohio. And of course, this was in the 40s and they were taking a bus rather than the train here. And they got to about Ritzville and it was very dusty, so it must have been the wind was really whipping up. And she turned to her husband and said, you know, is this a cyclone or a tornado? And he said, honey, that's just our land blowing by. Farmers in much of central Washington used dry land farming practices. They hauled water for their cisterns. The farmers and public appealed to Congress to fund an irrigation project, but their cries could not shake any money from the government. The nation was in the middle of the Great Depression. Unemployment was above 20%. People needed jobs. People needed hope. Gone, too, was the way of old politics. In 1932, the American people put their fate in the hands of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. His overwhelming presidential victory signaled a new way of thinking in the United States and his election marked a new era for the farmers of Washington, for those present and for those yet to come. Yes, the task can be helped by definite efforts to raise the values of agricultural products and with this the power to purchase the output of our cities. It can be helped by preventing realistically the tragedy of the growing loss through poor foreclosure of our small homes and our farms. Roosevelt enacted the New Deal, and jobs were the highest priority of the nation. In 1933, construction on the Grand Coulee Dam began. They meant to permanently dam the river in the same spot that glacial dams had millions of years ago. Uncle Sam, he took the challenge in the year of 33 for the farmers and the workers and for all humanity. 
Now, River, you can ramble where the sun sets in the sea. But while you're rambling, River, you can do some work for me. Roll, Columbia, won't you roll, roll, roll. Roll, Columbia, won't you roll, roll. Initially, the focus of the dam was jobs and electricity. In 1934, FDR personally inspected the progress of the project and endorsed making it high enough to provide enough electricity to pump water to irrigate the Columbia Basin. Potato growing would soon open up beyond Ellensburg, Yakima, and western Washington, but it took time. The infrastructure of the Columbia Basin Project took a decade to build and deliver water to the farms of the region. The Federal Bureau of Reclamation installed more than 300 miles of canals from Quincy to the Tri-Cities area. It would forever simply be known as the Basin. It would stand for new beginnings, new hope, new life. It really was the wild frontier when we hit the basin, but it was opportunities for many that needed to be. The idea of water brought farmers from around the nation and beyond to central Washington, where land was as available as it was fertile. In the 1950s and 60s, men and women packed up their lives and moved to the desert of the Columbia Basin with the hope of making their own way on their own land. Hank Thompson was one of those men. We were absolutely convinced, my sister and brother and I, that daddy had taken us to hell because the towns, they were old towns but the basin had opened up and changed them a lot. There wasn't really housing. You really did have to clear the sagebrush. You know, I don't even know what to say, except that it was so hard and you just tackled, you just dove in and started clearing the land and making it work. In the mid-1950s, water finally hit the towns throughout central Washington and it was pretty exciting because my dad and mom were exciting that the water was finally going to hit, you know, their ground. And um, daddy would kind of keep us posted on the stages because it had to fill the canal first and then the ditches. And then when he said it's coming is when we go stand in the ditch. And it was exciting. And I don't even know why, except that it was finally there. Once the water came, Rella's father knew potatoes would provide for his family in more ways than one. Rella, her husband Ron, and brother Porky joined him in his vision. He loved them. He would raise potatoes. Ron and Porky would get so upset with him because he just loved them. And he just liked growing potatoes. And he was a good grower. Um, and he just raised them because he just loved them. He would tell Ron, you make money on something else. If we can't make uh, money on potatoes, that's okay. We got to grow them anyway. My degree was in business and I'm looking at him like, what the hell does that mean? Today, the next generation still grows potatoes in the tradition of Hank on a farm near the Snake River. It was Hank's vision to change the desert. You looked at this, it was dry. There was one pheasant out here and he was probably lost. It was so barren and uh, nothing green. And I could understand once we brought the water out here what Hank saw his first potato crop starting to turn green. It was just amazing what it did to the, to the soil out here. It became green and pretty soon uh, this country will raise just about any crop you want to raise. When water arrived in the basin, opportunity exploded for those looking for a fresh start. The water brought adventurers, gamblers, and farmers left with nothing after the dirty 30s. The federal government held land drawings for servicemen freshly home from World War II. Some had no background in farming, while others thrived in their new home. 
Nelson Cox's father was one of them. You know, when I was a kid, there was a lot of people that drew units, but not very many of them survived. A lot of them really didn't know how to farm, you know, and a lot of them might have known how to farm in a different area. This was, this area was kind of unique to itself. You know, wonderful growing season and everything else, but you got to get the crop planted and get it to survive. And then you had to water it appropriately or you ruin your crop. And our yields are nowhere close to what they are nowadays. The canals and ditches brought water, but the wind and dirt still blew. If your crop wasn't ruined by the wind and weather, you still had to get it sold. Some drove their potatoes to Seattle to sell direct to the urban masses. With processors and packing plants emerging throughout central Washington, the farmers had to stick to their guns to get a fair price. While the land was being tamed, marketing the crop was opening a new wild frontier. You know, when I was when I was younger, there were 30 or 40 growers right here in this area. Each small farm grew 15 to 50 acres, you know. Everybody had potatoes in their rotation. They had sugar beets, they had potatoes, and then they grew the wheat, and some of them grew hay, and you know, the different crops. But those were a few onions. That was kind of the mainstay. We grow more than 300 different crops in Washington state alone, and it's because of our ability to irrigate. Today, the Columbia Basin Project serves about 671,000 acres in east central Washington. We grow everything from apples and potatoes to hops for beer and grapes for wine. In fact, the wine industry in Washington now includes, get this, more than 900 wineries, 350 growers, and 50,000 acres of land, all made possible by irrigation. Our team caught up with Victor Palencia of Palencia Winery right here in Kennewick. Here's his story. You know, the season's been beautiful. The flavors have been amazing. In fact, this vineyard is actually called Big River, the irony of it all. The Wallach Slope, uh, that happens to be the second hottest region in Washington, and just beautiful ripe texture, color, and flavors. My name is Victor Palencia. I am the owner and winemaker for Palencia Wine Company, and we're here today at Monarca Winery in Kennewick, Washington. It's literally the heartland of wine country. Within a 60-mile radius, I can find some of the uh, more premier vineyard sites. This is gonna be now my 21st vintage. I was very fortunate that I uh, got an early start, <laughs> naturally. Uh, I grew up in Prosser, Washington. The fact that I grew up around wine grapes helps me understand wine and, and wine grapes themselves. Um, so that, I think, translates into wines that are truly uh, of definition and varietal characteristic and, and just uh, uh, unique in nature. The importance of water and wine, it, it's crucial. And it, it's, it's amazing to think, but we are literally in a desert land. Wine grapes thrive in this environment. Um, and, and I should add to that, it's not just the grapes themselves, it's the quality of wine grapes that are grown with this uh, uh, arid climate, if you may. Um, uh, we can pinpoint the usage of water in the most efficient manner, and, and in addition to that, grow the best quality we can. So uh, it's, it's interesting to think, but wine grapes are one of the most efficient growing crops out there because we don't necessarily require a tremendous amount of water, but it is, uh, it is essential. I mean, you can't do it without the water. Red Mountain happens to be one of the hottest region in Washington state. So naturally, we got to have access to proper water uh, to be able to manage these, these growing techniques. What makes Red Mountain so special is the beautiful extraction you get from these berries. Look at that color. Just a beautiful, beautiful color. We are definitely uh, a diverse region. And, and what I love about this place is you get the whole dinner. You, have, you can, you can uh, uh, find some of the best local wine producers, uh, amazing potato farmers, fresh produce, um, the list goes on and on. And it's all because of our vast region, uh, the rich agriculture, but additional to, the, to the having access to great farming uh, and water, of course. Yes, wine is kind of that sweetheart food product that we grow here in the basin, but there are farmers growing multiple crops, providing food for Americans and people around the world. Our friends at Washington Grown caught up with Nicole Berg, who farms on the Horse Heaven Hills, where diversity in farming is impossible without irrigation. Here's her story. Now, Val's traveling to Patterson, an area that rarely sees rain, but serves as home to Berg Farms. She spoke with Nicole Berg about how this family farm relies on irrigation to keep their crops thriving. 
We farm wheat, sweet corn, um, potatoes, onions, carrots, bluegrass seed, beans, peas, all on the farm. Wow. How are they able to grow so much in an area that only gets seven inches of precipitation a year? When we decided to come back, me and my two brothers, being fourth generation, um, we were a dry land farm. We had dry land wheat only. Um, and in order to kind of turn the corner and make room for some of the next generations, you had to expand. And expanding it gets into irrigated agriculture. Um, we looked at it as an opportunity for irrigated agriculture to come on the farm and the diversification. Because if you look at the world today, we need to feed the world. And we have to do it through precision ag and, and through farming. And in the Horse Heaven Hills, the best way to do it is through water out of the mighty Columbia River. Um, we pump about six miles underground in a 42 inch pipe up to the edge of the farm and then it comes out through our big pivots. We only water when the plant needs the water. You know, if you have good quality in your plants and you do good management practices, whether it's through your irrigation water management or your soil moisture monitoring, it will help you create that round potato in, in the, and not a kind of a weird looking potato in the, in the supermarket. <laughs> right. How does technology help you manage water? We can do everything through the computer systems, through our cell phones, through our iPads, our notepads. We can turn on and off the water. We can gauge the pressures coming up from the river. Also, it's helped in conservation. We don't water as much as probably we did 10 years ago. Irrigation water management is just kind of something that's the wave of the future. It's what everybody's doing and it really is a science. So you become a business person and a scientist. I asked Nicole if she could show me their pump station down by the bank of the river. So remember the water that was coming out at the farm? Yes. Uh, that's where it's coming out from right here. Hot diggity dog. Out of the Columbia River. Um, there's a pipe that jets out into the river. Big huge pipe. It has fish screens on it. Then it comes into the pump station. There's about 4,800 horsepower down here at the pump station. So how much water does this pump up to your farm? Uh, can you take as much as you want? Is that regulated? So the Columbia River is regulated by the Corps of Engineers. So what happens is, is we had to get a permit and it's called 71 CFS, which is cubic feet per second of water we're permitted to send up to the farm. So when we pump our water out, we save water somewhere else. So there's really, we don't take any water out. The balance again It balance there. again, yeah. Farming in Washington and across is the safest food in the world. Through all our technologies, through all our research we do in the universities, we take a pride in growing safe food for everybody. And tasty food. You know, I want everybody to like my sweet corn. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Coming up next, we'll take a look at how the dams play a role in more than just agriculture. Stay with us. Thanks for watching. For generations, the world has looked to farmers as the caretakers of the land and providers of our family's most vital nutrition. Today, wheat and barley farmers throughout eastern Washington honor that legacy and continue in a tradition of innovation that will ensure families have the food, clean water, and soil they need for generations to come. Washington Wheat and Barley. Quality you can count on. Port of Benton drives economic growth, trade, and tourism by providing quality infrastructure and multimodal transportation for businesses and the community in Tri-Cities, Washington. If you are starting a new business, relocating, need space to grow, or planning an expansion, opportunity happens here. Join international companies in science, technology, value-added agriculture, and advanced manufacturing in one of the fastest growing and affordable communities in the inland Pacific Northwest. There's a reason salmon are an icon for the people of the Pacific Northwest. Their life journey is one of strength and resilience. Salmon are an anadromous species. This means they migrate from the ocean to freshwater to spawn, which is incredibly unique. In the Pacific Northwest, we have five species of salmon, Chinook, Coho, Pink, Sockeye, and Chum. The life cycle for Pacific salmon begins when a female deposits her eggs in a nest, or red. 
Once she deposits the eggs, a male will fertilize them. The female then gently pushes the gravel back over the nest and guards it against predators and other fish. The eggs develop over time, consuming the yolk for about a month. The eggs then grow into tiny fish called fry. The fry live in shallow stream edges and calm areas, eating insects for energy and growth. After surviving the stream for up to a year, juvenile salmon become smolt. These fish are ready to begin their journey downstream towards the ocean. These fish will feed in estuaries where fresh water and salt water meet. Estuaries are important places for smolt to eat and adapt from fresh water to salt water. The physical changes required for these salmon to move from fresh water to salt water are amazing and difficult. That's why so few fish do it. After a few weeks, the small salmon are ready to enter the ocean. Once in the ocean, the salmon grow quickly, feeding on other fish, shrimp, and crustaceans. Predators, including humans, whales, sea lions, and other fish, consume a large amount of salmon every year. Salmon live two to seven years in the ocean before they return to their freshwater birthplace to spawn or give birth. They move up the rivers and use fish ladders to traverse dams. Their natural instinct guides them to their birthplace to lay and fertilize the next generation of eggs. After spawning, all Pacific salmon die and they provide nutrients to the stream beds and the overall ecosystem. The process begins again with the new eggs, and the life cycle of this resilient species continues. Part of the reason that rivers and salmon are so complicated is because they stretch out over big areas. Salmon are gonna be born here in Eastern Washington. They're gonna travel hundreds of miles before they get to salt water. Once they get to the Pacific Ocean, our Washington State fish are gonna turn right and go up to the Gulf of Alaska. They're gonna swim thousands of miles. And then those fish come all the way back home. Now it does get complicated because our salmon that originate in eastern Washington, they swim right past Puget Sound on their way past Canada up to the Gulf of Alaska. Our fish have got to go up there because that's where their food is. That's where they get big and strong, fat and happy. But on the way, there are Puget Sound orca pods that like to feed on them too. So there's been a lot of concern lately about the health of those Puget Sound orcas. And for folks who want to support the Puget Sound orcas, they've been turning a lot of attention to Eastern Washington salmon as a way to help rescue the orcas. Well, just like about every environmental story I know, you gotta back up and take the big picture view. These orcas are a very long-lived species. They don't reproduce quickly. That was the very group of animals where they collected almost all of the killer whales that ended up in SeaWorld or ended up in movies. You start taking a lot of adults away from the population of a slow growing animal, that's really gonna affect their population dynamics over time. Another thing that I think is really affecting the Puget Sound orcas is the quality of water that they swim in. It's not uncommon for there to be a sewer break somewhere along the line within that Puget Sound corridor. Puget Sound also is a highly industrialized area. Anybody who's been to Seattle and seen the port of Seattle, there are acres and acres of industrial development right along the water. There's also a lot of boat traffic there, lots of noise. Orcas hunt using echolocation, sonar, if you will. They rely on sound, how quickly sound travels away from them and how quickly sound comes back to them. So with lots of boat motors going overhead, that's gotta be very noisy and harder for them to hear and hunt effectively. If you think about it, it's the only endangered mammal that we're expecting to live in a population center, right? Expecting orcas to thrive in downtown Seattle waterfront is kind of like expecting grizzly bears to survive downtown in Denver. Maybe not the best habitat for people and those large predatory animals to be so close together. 
In order to have the river system that we know today and all of its benefits, we have to include the dams. And the benefit of the dams that impacts all of us is our clean, renewable hydropower. The energy we all use in our homes comes from the dams on these rivers. Hydropower was one of the original reasons that President Roosevelt wanted to install the dams. There are four dams on the main stem of the Lower Columbia from McNary to Bonneville, and five on the Lower Snake from Hell's Canyon Dam to Ice Harbor Dam. We spoke with Rick Dunn of Benton PUD to find out why hydropower is essential for our future. The Benton PUD's residential electricity rate is around seven cents a kilowatt hour. Um, the rest of the country, you know, I hate to pick on our friends in California, but they can go as high as 15 cents and even in some peak periods, 25 to 30 cents a kilowatt hour. So we're the local electricity provider. So we don't generate our own electricity, we buy it and we distribute that electricity to about 55,000 customers in our service area. We are one of 135 preference customers of the Bonneville Power Administration. They're a federal marketing agency that, that actually markets the output of the federal Columbia River power system, which includes all the dams and the hydroelectricity associated with the dams. Um, Bonneville Hydro represents 75 to 80% of our customers' annual usage. At a dam, really, the water has two choices. It can go over a spillway, which is a lot of times what people see when they're driving along the road, right? Or underneath the water, there are large pipes that carry the water into the actual structure of the dam. And inside there, there are turbines with blades on them. And as the water falls through the blades, it spins the shaft of a generator. And so by converting the mechanical motion of water and then the turbine spinning, in an electric generator, you make electricity on the out, output of that. When you think about renewable resources, I think the easiest thing to think about is the fuel. So where do you get the fuel to run the generators? In our case, the fuel is water. And uh, water, as we all know, that water goes through a cycle of, you know, flowing out or through the river system into the ocean, back up into the air, comes in in precipitation and gets put back into the mountains in the form of snow. And so that natural cycle repeats itself every year. Thinking back in time, if you said, well, if we didn't have hydro from the beginning, where would we have gone? Well, I think you can look as far as investor-owned utilities, for example, who have uh, different customers, but their source of generation has typically been coal-fired power plants. I, I always say we're way ahead of the clean energy curve. Um, and so we can't take hydro for granted. Uh, the problem with wind and solar is Everybody always says this, the sun doesn't shine all the time and the wind doesn't blow all the time. So you gotta have a resource that can back that up. And hydro is really uniquely positioned to do that. Washington State passed the Clean Energy Transformation Act with a aspirational goal of 100% clean by 2045. Um, hydro is two thirds of the annual energy that's consumed by uh, customers in the greater Northwest. But if you contrast the Northwest with the rest of the country, they're very jealous of, of where we're at. Without hydro, 100% clean would be nearly impossible in the time frame um, that we're talking about. I'm Mike Gonzalez with Franklin PUD. I want to invite you to follow our brand new social media sites. On our sites, you'll find the latest Franklin PUD news, updates on power outages, and ways to save you money. Yeah, it's taken us a few years to get on board this social media thing, but we're here. Just search Franklin PUD on your favorite social media site. Franklin PUD is lighting the way. Because of the dams, we also have a reliable and environmentally friendly transportation mode for our trade goods. We're able to move wood products, cars, bulk materials, and grains to and from our coastal ports. Wheat farmers have been using the rivers to get their grains from their inland farms to the export ports in Vancouver and Portland for decades now. They utilize barges to move grain efficiently and safely down the river. Here's a quick look at how our grains move from our farms to the ports.
Our barges keep more trucks off the road and they're the most fuel efficient mode of handling freight. The barges also have the lowest emissions when you compare them to trucks and trains. Again, our friends at Washington Grown caught up with Kristen Mara of the Pacific Northwest Waterways Association a while ago to learn about transportation on the river. Washington's waterways, they're majestic, they water our crops, and they're also a vital part of transporting goods. In fact, the Columbia River is the third largest grain export gateway in the world. I spoke with Kristen Mara, Executive Director of the Pacific Northwest Waterways Association, about the importance of Washington's rivers, lakes, and dams. Our waterways are really the competitive advantage that our Washington state growers and producers are able to use, especially when they're trying to compete in very tough overseas markets. This is the top wheat export gateway in the country. We move more wheat out of the Columbia Snake River system than is leaving the United States any other place or any other way. Uh, so it is a very critical um, export point for those Washington state growers, for our potato farmers, our cherry farmers, and other tree fruits peas, lentils, the list goes on of Washington grown agricultural products. They cannot uh, do what they do. They can't get out to those export markets without the ports and waterways. What's the role that Washington dams play with Washington agriculture? The dams on the Columbia Snake River system are unique here in the U.S. in that they're multi-purpose. They produce hydropower. We get 70% of our electricity here in the Northwest from clean renewable hydropower that really sets us apart from other parts of the country. But then the dams also provide for commercial navigation. One typical four barge tow is moving the same amount of cargo as 538 trucks. Just picture all of those trucks on the highways. The dams are able to make irrigation possible. They really provide a lot of benefits. What does the future look like for Washington Waters? When you think about waterways, you need to think about them in the same way that you think about highways and bridges um, and airports and other kinds of infrastructure. It's all aging. It needs reinvestment so that our future farmers, our future producers are able to still compete overseas. We've seen how wheat gets from the farm to the grain elevator and into a barge, but where does it go from there? Tomas is in Portland with the next step in getting wheat from the Tri-Cities to the port. I'm here at the helm of the Clearwater Tugboat, where I'm going to travel alongside a batch of Washington wheat as it makes its way down the Columbia River before it's sent all over the world. All right, guys, coming loose. Shaver Transportation Company is a 134-year-old family-owned tug and barge line that moves freight up and down the Columbia River system. Rob Rich, the Vice President of Marine Services at Shaver, explains how the barging process works. The export elevators will order wheat from one of the 27 upriver grain elevators uh, that load barges. So the export elevator will order one location at, say, the Dalles, order another barge for another location such as Umatilla, order a barge for a location such as uh, Windust on the Lower Snake River, and the fourth barge could be ordered into Lewiston, Idaho. So the four barges take off. The first one is dropped at the Dalles, second one dropped at Umatilla, third and fourth on the way. So you get to your destination all the way at Lewiston, then they pick up that barge when it's loaded and work their way back down the river, picking up their barges at the various elevators they've loaded at. When those barges come down to the Portland Harbor, they are distributed to the export elevators that have loaded them. The grain elevator loads into the ship, and the ships take off to the Pacific Rim. You know, China, Korea, Japan, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Philippines are the uh, final destination for the wheat from the Columbia River. We're gonna head over to uh, one of our spud barges, which is a term for a tie-off. Okay. And we're gonna pick up uh, an empty grain barge. These barges are 275 to 300 feet long. When you put a four barge tow together, they're two barges wide, two barges long. When you take a 90 or 100 foot tugboat like this, you're at about 650 feet overall. Barging is by far the most fuel efficient, the most economical, uh, the most environmentally responsible and sustainable way of transporting. And you may ask, why are we not barging everywhere? It was, we, we actually. We don't have rivers everywhere. Right. Obviously, waterways. <laughs> so, yeah, so wherever there is access to the river for farmers to bring their wheat, then you have barging. As we make our way to pick up a barge, Captain Brad lets me take over. Aye. So right now you're idling ahead. Okay. These are your throttles and, and engines. Okay. Shift it hard to port. Okay. Hold on, guys. 
hard to port. Well, hard to starboard there. In other way, the, the boat's going to start swinging around. You catch me out on the high seas before you know it. But when we make our way back to port, I figure I should let the pros handle it. Well, Tomas, we're going to uh, head on down to the galley. All right, look at this. This is nice. I mean, I've seen apartments smaller than this. <laughs> this is great. Then, whoa, we check out the engine room and the crew quarters. Is yeah, this there's, comfy? There's room for you. It's got to make you feel pretty proud to think that you're in this hub of Washington food and exports being sent all over the world. Washington's largest export is agricultural products, and uh, it is an amazing opportunity to be involved in it. Well, Rob, thank you so much for showing me around a tugboat. Give me a chance to drive a tugboat. Tomas, you did great. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. Yeah. It's safe to say that the impact of our rivers goes well beyond agriculture. It impacts every aspect of commerce within our region, from Portland to Lewiston and beyond. A strange little city An evening so quiet But something is growing I heard the signs of life Those signs of life There's lots of stories about Pasco's founding, but it, it was a railroad town, BNSF. Um, has their main line that comes right through Pasco. Along with the great rail transportation, barging was also a primary means of moving wheat and other products that are grown here in the Mid-Columbia along the river. In fact, the Port of Pasco was formed in 1941, and we were formed to build a grain terminal to ship our farmers' grain down to Portland. And it's just a, a hub of agricultural production here. We have rail access to our industrial parks along with heavy truck access. And we also run the Tri-Cities Airport. The Tri-Cities is a, just a, a thriving and growing community. A lot of folks are choosing the Tri-Cities to expand their business, locate their new business. Most of that has to do with the fact that we've got three beautiful rivers. Oh, the light is changing on every river and road. You know, all sorts of different industries are here and thriving in, in the Tri-Cities area. You have great manufacturing. Of course, we've touched upon the agriculture and how important that is. We also have a national laboratory here in the Tri-Cities too, where there's cutting edge technology being developed daily. The river system has a really important story in what we see here in downtown Pasco. These are the support services for all those workers and industries that depend directly on the river system all these things all intertwine and really couldn't happen without the great river system that we have. Oh, the light it is changing on every river and road. So one of the things that we're really excited about here in the Tri-Cities is our capabilities in energy. Uh, we are a, a clean energy hub of the Pacific Northwest and that's becoming increasingly important. The state legislator passed legislation that directs that we will be reducing our carbon emissions significantly in the next uh, 15 or 20 years. And a key to all of that is the backbone that we have of carbon-free energy that's created by the dams. And energy really will be, we believe, the future of the Tri-Cities. Our jobs, our local shops, and our schools, they're all here because of our rivers. Our energy bills are low because of our rivers. Our way of life is awesome because of our rivers. These qualities make our region an incredible place for business and recreation. When it comes to having fun, our rivers, channels, and reservoirs are a water enthusiast's dream. <laughs> The foil. <laughs> yeah, so one of the neat things about the Tri-Cities is, is, is our access to the river. Uh, we have a ton of different boat launches and if you go to any of the parks with boat launches on a, on a weekend day or frankly a lot of other days of the week you're going to see a ton of folks uh, putting their boats in the water, fishing, recreating, water skiing, jet skiing. 
and we've even had the opportunity to host large bass tournaments and, and other things like that here that are that are really central to to what we enjoy and how we in, enjoy recreating here in the Tri-City area. I'm Krista Patterson and I'm a co-owner of Northwest Paddleboarding alongside my mom. I just love being here. I also love the area. I love that it's not too like hustle and bustly. There's also enough people here that we can have lots of fun events and there's still a lot to do. We even have tourists come in through on our steamboats and those are awesome. They bring tourists to our area to purchase from our small businesses. We have the boat races here and we have triathlons and things that happen here and whenever I like learn about other people who also uh, rely on the river and all of the ways that they do it's interesting to see how we can all coexist. My name is Lance Mamiya. My family are originally from the big island of Hawaii. We grew up surfing and canoeing and fishing and spear diving all the things that you can do in the ocean right. When I moved up here I looked around and we passed by this Columbia River and I looked over and, and I said, hey, what's that? Well, that's our river system. It's the Columbia, Yakima and Snake. I'm like, wow, this is fantastic. What I thought would be a three to five year stint here in the, in the Tri-Cities turned into this 20 plus year love affair with, with this area. Right? So whether or not you're paddling or paddle boarding, swimming, or even just boating or sitting out in the water just relaxing. It's this connection and it's just this quiet spot. Uh, you know, all rivers lead to the ocean and you know, the ocean being my first love, this was like a lifeline back to the ocean. Hydropower, agriculture, transportation, commerce, recreation, all these things are great, but what about the fish? As we mentioned earlier, Pacific salmon are a part of our culture and we must protect them. Certain populations of sockeye, coho, and chinook salmon are listed as endangered or threatened in our region. Some of these populations are recovering and many of us believe we can have both our current river system with the dams and a thriving Pacific salmon population. This philosophy comes from years of scientific research, fish passage improvements, and habitat recovery. Salmon don't care about state lines or international borders or time zones. They just go about doing their salmon thing. So it makes it complicated for us as a society to figure out how to effectively manage them as a species so that the local people benefit, but then also the, the salmon species benefits too. As a fisheries scientist, my job, my role is to help people think about fish when they're making decisions about the river system. And I really think that modern management of the Columbia Snake River System is a great example of win-win natural resource management. Just this past spring, they did testing of a new turbine design at Ice Harbor Dam, which is the lowest dam on the Snake River System. This new turbine that was designed with the latest science and engineering breakthroughs passes 98.5% of salmon safely. And at the same time, with those improvements in fish passage, they also gained a 4% gain in energy efficiency. To me, that's a great example of using technology to bring a win-win solution for natural resources, for salmon, but also for people. The money that we pay Bonneville goes to fish and wildlife programs. And so we've been taking fish and wildlife programs seriously for a long time. Fish bypass facilities that are improved at the dams over the years have been improved. Um, investments in hatcheries, in habitat restoration, um, research and development. You know, it, it all comes from electric ratepayers. We live in a fantastic place here in the Pacific Northwest. We have the amazing Columbia River system with the Snake and the Yakima Rivers joining into that system. We've got a large federal hydro complex on the Columbia and the Snake River. We have great agriculture. We've got it all here in central Washington. That's why I love living here. And I think that really with science-based modern management of natural resources, we really can have it all. 
As people and the rivers have learned to coexist, there's an element that's key to thriving fish populations. The Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife operates dozens of fish hatcheries around the state. These hatcheries help to populate fish throughout the region and lakes and rivers. Our team got a rare peek at a nearby fish hatchery and learned the vital role that these facilities play in our river ecosystem. So what's the purpose of a hatchery? The main goal of our agency is the conservation of those wild fish and their populations. And it's important that we continue the legacy of, of fish within our state because they've been around for years. Do hatcheries just raise fish for rivers? Um, no, hatcheries raise fish for lakes, uh, streams, uh, but most importantly, rivers. Uh, yes, we are located right next to the Columbia River, and a lot of the fish that we raise here go directly into the Columbia River. But these fish, for instance, are rainbow trout. These are all gonna go into lakes here in Eastern Washington that provide recreational trout opportunities. What we have here is some steelhead uh, that we're raising up right now to be released this spring. This is the size of our steelhead right now. They're just little guys. With salmon, we take the eggs in the fall and then we release them in the late spring, early summer. It's a long ways to the saltwater from our facility here. It's about 365 miles. It takes these fish about a month to get all the way to the saltwater from up here. But if you think about it, a month in a fish, 365 miles, you can do the math on how many miles they may travel each day. Columbia River is only right, right down there. It's really close. So all these fish coming into this structure are all returning Chinook and Steelhead. They smelled this water from the moment they got probably within five to 10 miles of the Columbia River when the, on their migration from the ocean to the fresh water. Um, they smelled this water and they knew exactly where they needed to come. One around the tail. There you go. Now you, now you got her. Yeah. So what kind of fish is this? That's a Chinook you're hanging on to, Callie. That's a great big female. Um, this is typical fish that returns to our hatchery facility. It's pretty big, isn't it? What is this one? That's a, that's a male Chinook too. Um, so we've seen both the male and the female. They're pretty lively, aren't they? So what happens after they spawn? So the salmon life cycle is they go to the ocean, spend a few years, return. They never go back. They spawn till they die. But those carcasses contribute greatly to our habitat, uh, other animals, uh, but they're key nutrients for the offspring. Wow, that's a beautiful fish, Joel. That's so awesome. That's a hatchery fish too. No, no adipose fin. That's a great specimen of a steelhead here at the Ringgold Hatchery and, and most rivers here in Washington State as well. So how do the numbers look in the system? Well, the numbers are really good, Callie. A lot of people would say these are the good old days when it comes to salmon fishing. Um, steelhead populations aren't doing that great right now throughout the state of Washington. Salmon populations are doing well. It's kind of cyclic though. Some years are great for coho, not so good for Chinook. Other years are great for steelhead, not so good for coho or Chinook. It can really vary based on ocean conditions. You know, it, there's so many factors out there that play a role in the survival or the fitness of fish returning to the hatchery system or even to a, a, a wild system for that matter. So why is there so much research? You know, fish are important to Washington, Oregon, and the whole Pacific Northwest. Uh, it all starts right here at the hatchery. This research is important for forecasting future runs of different species of salmon to include coho, chinook, steelhead, sockeye, pinks, chum, and the list goes on, Kelly. There's so many different fish out there, people don't realize the opportunities that Washington has for fishing here, both in Eastern Washington and Western Washington. Benton PUD is dedicated to delivering reliable energy to all of our customers. But that's not all we do. We strive to provide education for all ages, to strengthen conservation, and promote reliable power sources. Being a part of the community we serve is a priority at Benton PUD. 
And that's why we are your trusted energy partner. The Washington Department of Ecology and EPA say river water temperatures are too hot and they want dam operators to fix them. They've added a river temperature provision in the EPA permit with the Columbia River Basin dams. Those working on the river say monitoring the temperature of the entire river system is something that was never intended in those original permits. I recently talked with Northwest River Partners about the maximum daily temperature load to see what the science is saying and if regulating temperatures is even possible. We understand as a region that we have to be good stewards. Right. Right. And in this next uh, round of fights time, over dams in the Pacific uh, Northwest, also... Kurt Miller knows the future of low-cost, carbon-free hydropower stewards, is in jeopardy. Uh, because of recent regulatory developments in Oregon and Washington and at the federal level, dam operators are facing what Miller calls new and unattainable rules that put the hydro system at risk. A river temperature issue is important because river temperatures matter to salmon. Salmon are cold water creatures. So whether they're in the river or in the ocean, they prefer cold water. And if the water gets too hot, it can actually, it, it, first of all, it can start to kind of upset them, but then beyond that, it can make it harder for them to feed, it can exhaust them, and eventually it can kill them. The EPA says temperatures are hovering above the 68 degree required mark at several of the dams during the summer months, including Ice Harbor Dam that hovers around 70.5 degrees, Lower Monumental at 69.1, and Little Goose at 68.4 degrees. Miller says this is a complex issue involving multi-jurisdictional laws. The EPA actually came out with a report um, just recently and it, uh, and it did say, you know, first of all, that the water is too hot coming into the states. Second, it said that climate change is responsible for between two and four degrees uh, Fahrenheit of warming of river temperatures, which is really serious if you think about that. Uh, but then they also uh, modeled the effect of dams on rivers and the EPA report said that the dams also increase river temperatures. While the EPA used a model to attempt to estimate the effect of dams on river temperatures, it took actual temperature measurements of water coming in from Canada and Idaho. The TMDL report clearly demonstrates that water entering the U.S. from Canada is already too warm by a substantial margin to meet the Washington state standard in the summer months. The rub is that the water that's coming in upstream from Canada into Washington State and then from Idaho into Oregon and Washington State is already so hot during the summer that it typically exceeds the limits that the states of Oregon and Washington have established. And so our concern has been that they really are potentially setting up the dams to fail because if you set, just like in anything, if you set an unattainable standard, uh, uh, basically it's going to be one of those situations where no matter what the dam operators do, they're not going to be able to make the water as cool um, as the state limits if the water that's coming from upstream, the water they're inheriting, is already too hot. The same is true for water entering the Lower Snake River dams from Idaho. In fact, Idaho participated in developing similar guidance with the EPA for the Snake River in 2003. But in the end, Idaho dissented due to reservations about attainability. According to the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality website, these reservations persist to this day. Even the EPA recognizes that meeting these temperature quality standards is going to be really difficult for the states of Oregon and Washington. So they've recommended to both that they change those standards. There is another study by Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in 2002 that actually said, hey, you know, without the dams, the water would be a lot shallower, and so it would be much more prone to heating. 
And so actually the dams, according to that study, and it's a peer-reviewed study, said that the dams actually help mitigate the extreme temperatures. They kind of uh, take off the top and they kind of raise the bottom and so they kind of make it a little bit more normal throughout the summer. So those are important things to understand is that, uh, that in, from that perspective, it's not entirely clear what the role on dams is because we do have this mixed message or this mixed science. But the thing we do know is that the dams produce thousands of megawatts of carbon-free electricity. And if carbon, if carbon and climate change is really driving river temperatures and ocean temperatures, then what the dams do is they help fight climate change. This is the McNary Dam behind me. You can see how calm the water is. And these waters are a bit cooler than the regular river temperatures. So if you want to even out and make the river temperatures cooler, what you'll do is release this water upstream. The state of Washington is also weighing in. Vince McGowan, the water quality manager at the Department of Ecology, was quoted in the Seattle Times saying, quote, this is just the beginning. We are going to have the opportunity to talk about what can happen and what is feasible. We're on the path where we can have those conversations with dam operators working with us on how they're going to meet our temperature standards, end quote. Miller says the problem with taking an excessive and unrealistic regulatory approach is that in the extreme, it could add billions of dollars to the cost of operating the hydroelectric system without actually helping salmon. It could also add excess cost to communities who rely on the low cost of hydropower to make ends meet, especially now that residential customers in the Northwest are facing a financial crisis and residential energy consumption is rising because of the pandemic. When you think of uh, Franklin PUD and, um, you know, in Pasco, Washington, or you think of other uh, organizations throughout um, the Northwestern states, it, those utilities, those public power utilities are not-for-profit utilities. So any increase in the cost of hydro operations essentially gets passed through directly to them. So if the state of Washington comes up with some really costly plans to try to force dams to lower river temperatures to levels that they really can't. Um, that's all going to pass on to our members and the customers they serve at a time when we literally, as a nation and a region, cannot afford that. After reading through public comments, the EPA may submit new requirements to both Washington and Oregon state governments to implement their water quality plans. Well, as you just saw, hundreds of people work to protect and ensure that these waters are kept clean and thriving. These are our rivers. They're truly a way of life here in the Pacific Northwest. If you have any questions or want to learn more, I encourage you to reach out to the organizations that supported this program. Be a part of the conversation. The more you know, the more you'll understand how these waters affect every single home in the Pacific Northwest and beyond. I'm Mike Gonzalez. Thanks so much for watching.